All right, hello and welcome to the fifth of many live stream noon conferences hosted by MRI Online. It is just now 12 o'clock and I see the number is still rising, so I want to give it a few more minutes, seconds really. Um, just wanted to say welcome and in response to the changes happening around the world right now and the shutting down of in-person events, we have decided to provide free daily noon lectures to all radiologists worldwide. Today we are joined by Dr. Mikesh Harrisangani. He is a professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School and director of abdominal MRI at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. In addition, he serves as director of the Clinical Discovery Program Center for Molecular Imaging Research at MassGen and has been the section editor of GU Radiology for the AJR. He has been practicing in the field of abdominal radiology for over 20 years, has published over 100 peer-reviewed papers, and has edited five textbooks in the field of radiology. A reminder that there will be time at the end of this hour for a Q&A session. Please use the Q&A feature and we will get to as many of these questions as we can before our time is up. That being said, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Harrisangani. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Ashley, um, and welcome uh, everyone. I hope everybody's staying safe and uh, uh, taking the due precautions uh, so that we can overcome this crisis uh, in a healthy manner. Uh, so having said that, the topic of discussion today is going to be uh, looking at how MR can be helpful in patients with rectal cancer. And if you look at the, uh, the indications for MR specifically in the abdomen and pelvis, uh, there are a couple of indications like prostate and rectum where MR has certainly uh, become front and center in terms of what uh, information is, is gathered prior to therapy and, and the modality of choice. So MR is certainly becoming the modality of choice. And, and what we are going to do today is uh, talk about these or cover these uh, specific points. The first is why MR? Why do we need to do MR in, in rectal cancer? The second is how do we do the MR? Talk a little bit about technique and uh, kind of give you some pointers in terms of what the ideal protocol ought to be. Uh, and then the most important thing is once you do the MR, the question is what do you look for and how do you put that in a comprehensive report? Um, and while we are discussing the content of our report, we're going to talk about a few anatomical concepts which are key uh, to remember when one is looking at rectal MR. Uh, talk about standardized reporting, why that is uh, very important. And I'll show you... Um, or, or provide you with resources that you can use to download uh, free templates for, for the rectal MR. And then talk about uh, imaging pointers for, uh, uh, you know, that, that predict worse prognosis in these, uh, in these patients. So the first question is why? And uh, if you look at, this is, you know, a year old in 2018, uh, rectal cancer gets clumped with, uh, with colonic tumors. So if you look at colorectal, they are the fourth most a uh, common type of cancer, and about one third of these uh, patients are, uh, are rectal cancers. Uh, so it's not a trivial number. It certainly is a significant uh, number of cancer cases that we see in a year. And if you look at this particular um, distribution of what the five-year survival is, it shows you that when the tumor is localized to the lumen um, and, gets, and that patient gets appropriate therapy, there is a very good chance of a five-year um, a disease-free survival, but as the disease progresses and becomes regional or distant, then the five-year survival drops. And that's the reason why we have to be very diligent in accurately staging these patients. So from a very simplistic perspective, uh, if the uh, tumor is confined to the lumen, which means it stays inside the lumen of the rectum and doesn't extend out, the treatments are primary surgical. And you know, the standard is uh, what we refer to as tra uh, transmesorectal excision or TME surgery. Whereas if it extends beyond the confines of the wall and extends into the surrounding fat or adjacent pel uh, pelvic uh, parenchymal organs, uh, then those patients typically get um, new adjuvant chemoradiation therapy, and then they get subsequently followed up. And if things seem to be progressing in the right direction and looks like the tumor is uh, regressing and, and shrinking away, then those patients ultimately go for surgery. So again, this is a simplified grid. It's uh, just to kind of highlight what some of the um, um, mechanisms of how the tumor um, is, is treated. Uh, irrespective of what uh, or how you treat the disease, the goal 
both for the folks that treat the patient and for us is to prevent recurrence. And here is a patient who had a mucinous type of adenocarcinoma in the pelvis and came back after surgery with a local pelvic recurrence as you're seeing in this particular instance in the presacral region. And when the disease comes back or the patient gets local recurrence, that is a very difficult disease to get a uh, handle on. These patients typically have bad prognosis, they have poor, very poor quality of life. And so we have to do whatever is in our, um, uh, you know, whatever is available to us, use that uh, to the best of our ability to prevent this specific scenario from happening. And so accurate staging and appropriate treatment are the key things that will end up preventing local recurrence. And so with that said in mind, what we are trying to do, why we are doing MR is basically to try and distinguish those patients into, into, into those that have early lumen confined disease, which means the disease is not extended beyond the wall and those can, you know, as I said, get surgical modes of therapy and distinguish those from local spread and, and those with distant uh, pelvic spread because those require more aggressive modes of therapy prior to surgery. And then this is another important point of imaging is, you know, when you look at the primary tumor, you have to find uh, those specific imaging markers that can predict that this patient is going to do worse or going to have adverse prognostic uh, outcome. And we will be discussing what these points are. But this is sort of more or less in a nutshell what the um, uh, role of MR is in rectal cancer. So then, the, then comes the question of how do we do the MR? And, uh, you know, I think like most other um, MRs in the abdomen and pelvis, attention to detail in terms of technique is very uh, critical. If you um, use a generic protocol that you use all the pelvises, it's not going to suffice for accurate staging. You have to spend some time in optimizing the protocol so that you get the necessary information that is required. And so you use this, you know, the... Again, you can use a 1.5 or 3T, uh, use um, uh, the phased array coils that are available with your system uh, to the best uh, of your ability. And so let's look at what the protocol is. The first thing you do is you do what is referred to as the localizers or the scout images. And this basically gives the technologist an idea of what is the area of anatomy that needs to be covered. Generally, you want to be um, covering an anatomy that extends from the L5 S1 junction uh, down to the uh, level of the anal verge or perhaps a little bit lower than that uh, because that will give you an entire uh, coverage for you know where the rectum and the anal canal lie and give you will give you all the necessary information that you desire so that's in terms of coverage then the next sequence the technologies ought to run is the sagittal um, t2 weighted sequence and typically you like it to be a fast spin echo or a turbo spin echo t2 and this goes from one pelvic side wall to the other so that you cover the entire breadth of the viscera containing pelvis and the, and the rectum more or less resides in the center as you're seeing in this uh, instance. The reason for doing a sagittal first is so that you get a lay of the land of where, uh, the, um, uh, you know, where the rectum is, uh, what defines the rectum, where is the cancer, because based on uh, you know, where the tumor lies, you are going to be prescribing some other planes. And that's why it's important and critical to do the sagittal sequence first. After you do the sagittal, you do a true axial. And again, the extent is from the level of, a little below the level of the uh, anal verge up to the level of L5S1 or the aortic bifurcation. And the reason for doing the true axial is you're trying to look, take a look at the anatomy. And uh, you know, there, are, um, there are anatomical features in the, um, anal canal that are nicely laid out on the axial images uh, that can help you in staging low rectal cancers. And this is just showing you, if you take an axial slice at the level of the puborectalis muscle, which is this U-shaped muscle, that's where um, uh, traditionally, you know, the, um, the uh, columnar epithelium of the rectum becomes the um, squamous epithelium of the anal canal. And that's where anatomically or histologically you would uh, uh, locate the transition of the anal canal to the rectum, or sorry, the rectum to the anal canal. Now, once you're below this level, in the level of the anal canal, what there are two essential sphincters. You're looking for internal sphincter and you're looking for external sphincter. And so if you look here on this image, the, the green color is the internal sphincter. 
the internal sphincter is an involuntary muscle, um, uh, and it's the uh, continuation of the circular smooth muscle of the rectum. So it is a relatively um, has relatively T2 bright uh, signal compared to the external sphincter, which you see right here. The external sphincter is darker. It has similar signal intensity as the skeletal muscle because this is a striated uh, muscle, which uh, is different from the internal sphincter. And so, you know, uh, you need, whenever you look at a pelvis, whether it's for rectum, prostate, you know, keep sort of emphasizing this anatomy because it helps. One other way that you can distinguish the internal from the external sphincter is that the internal sphincter will show earlier enhancement after gadolinium compared to the external sphincter. So that's in terms of anatomy axial. Now after axial, we do what is referred to as the, the this is sort of the money sequence. It is the high resolution 10 T2 weighted oblique axial um, uh, images. Uh, these are the key um, uh, money sequences uh, in terms of staging. And what do you mean by that? So remember you acquired your sagittal. And in this instance, there is a very long um, segment of tumor. And what you're doing is uh, scanning perpendicular to the plane or axis of the cancer, as you see in this particular instance. And that is the reason why, uh, you know, that is the reason why you sort of uh, angulate to the uh, axis of the tumor. Uh, so these are the key sequences for staging. And why do we pay such um, close attention and, and pay a, a lot of emphasis on this is basically is because of this. If you look at this particular case, there is a tumor right here on the SAG and and here is a true axial image without any angulation. And when you look at the true axial image, if you look at the, from six o'clock to um, you know, about nine o'clock in position, there appears to be relatively unsharpness. And if someone asks you, is the tumor confined to the lumen or do you think the tumor is extending out? It can be very difficult and challenging to know if that's the case. Whereas if you look at the oblique, perpendicular oblique axial, you can see the tumor is confined to the lumen and it's not extending beyond. So it could mean you know, a difference in accurate staging. And that's why I cannot emphasize enough, you have to spend some time in terms of uh, making sure that these uh, sequences are adequately performed. And they are more, uh, they are higher in resolution than the conventional axial uh, T2-weighted sequence. So they have more detail uh, that you can look for in terms of anatomic delineation and staging of the tumor. After you do the, uh, uh, the uh, Oblique axial, you do the coronal T2-weighted. And again, the coronal sequence is um, to emphasize the anatomy, particularly for the low rectal cancers where you're looking for um, involvement of the sphincter complex. And so this is what the coronal uh, looks like. Um, and just to kind of blow it up a little bit, you see the, um, the levator muscle on either side. The levator muscles um, that form the pelvic floor are like hammocks on e either side. These levator muscles come down and insert into the puborectalis, which is this muscle that is um, uh, shown by the turquoise uh, arrows. And then below the puborectalis, you have the external sphincter. The external sphincter typically has three fascicles, which you are seeing right here. We have the upper, the mid, and the lower fascicle. And then you have the green arrows, which are pointing to the internal sphincter, that's this. Between the internal and the external sphincter is this bright uh, fat containing space and that is referred to as the intersphincteric space. Again, you know, you need to kind of keep looking at this and reinforcing the anatomy when you're looking at, uh, you know, Im images where patients don't have cancers and other pelvic so that, you know, when you do have a patient with uh, low rectal cancer, you're accurately depicting the anatomy and, and trying to figure out what's uh, involved or not. So pay attention to the anatomy in terms of um, in the coronal images. Uh, then we do DWI. Now, the money sequence is truly in terms of staging are the T2 weighted sequence. There is a school of thought that the diffusions and the gadolinium enhanced images are really not required. Uh, I, I can tell you in our practice, they can be extremely helpful and beneficial and they can complement the information that you get from the T2 weighted sequence. So typically you do a low B value, a high B value around 800 to 1000 and then calculate an ADC from that. And then uh, you, we also do gadolinium enhanced images and more so than the primary staging, these can be very critical when you're looking at post-treatment scans. And so here is an example of a patient who has a tumor in the, um, in the, uh, on the right wall uh, and you can see that there is restricted diffusion and abnormal enhancement. And after therapy, 
On the T2, it's very difficult to know whether there is any residual cancer, but on the ADC of the DWI, based on the enhancement, you can see that there is some residual cancer in that location. So uh, certainly of, of benefit in terms of follow-up. Um, and like I said, it's, it doesn't hurt to do that in the regular um, uh, staging protocol as well, because you certainly end up getting useful information. So that is the uh, how we do it. Now we come to what do we look for? Now, before we talk about um, uh, looking at the specific features for the rectal cancer, we need to re-emphasize uh, some um, anatomic facts and also uh, go through some of the terms uh, that are critical for you to know before you actually start looking at rectal cancer patients. So the first is anatomy. And the question is, how do we define the rectum on MR and, and what what are the boundaries that we use uh, on MR to, to truly say, you know, where the rectum begins and end. And so on MR, <clears throat> excuse me, we follow the, um, uh, the, uh, the perspective of the endoscopist. And from an endoscopist perspective, the, the rectum is the most distal part of the uh, GI tract that extends 15 centimeters from the anal verge. So this is what the endoscopist looks for and, and and characterizes as the rectum. So here is the anal verge, and they go 15 centimeters from there. And then they, they break it up into upper rectum, which is upper five centimeters, mid rectum, mid five centimeters, and lower rectum, that is the lower uh, five centimeters. And this is what we follow. And here is a sagittal T2 weighted MR showing you how you go along the, uh, the lumen of the rectum and draw 15 centimeters. And that's what um, is. Uh, is classified as the um, as a rectum. Now, you will see here that uh, based on this definition, you are actually including the most distal part, which is the anal canal, within the rectum. You know that's what the endoscopists do, and that's what we follow. So that's something for you to keep in the back of your mind. Now, uh, the question is, what defines the anal verge? Uh, typically, it's where the external sphincter ends. So the external sphincter is a little bit uh, extends a little bit lower than the internal sphincter. There are some institutions that take the most distal part of the internal sphincter as the anal verge. There are some institutions that take the most uh, distal part of the anal canal, which is where the external sphincter is as the anal verge. I mean, the difference between those two is about 0.5 centimeters. So you really are not, uh, you know, uh, accounting for a lot of difference, but the key is to talk to the surgical colleagues and oncologists in your respective institution and see you know, which, which definition of the anal words they would like to use. But irrespective of that, make sure that, you know, it's, it's the 15 centimeter counting from the, uh, the anal words as the, as the uh, definition of the rectum. Now, because uh, this definition of the rectum includes the anal canal, it means that if there are tumors primarily arising in the anal canal, which are primarily squamous cell carcinomas, you know, are also included in this, uh, in this uh, supposed uh, definition. And so the question that begs the question is, if you're looking at a pelvic MR, are you trying to distinguish an anal cancer from rectal cancer? And so if I show you these two coronal images, you know, one of them is a rectal cancer and one of them is an anal cancer and ask you, uh, what is the, um, uh, which one is which? it's very difficult to predict. If you look on histopathology, it's the one on the left was rectal and the one on the right was anal cancer. So as radiologists, we are not in the business of distinguishing anal from rectal cancer. So even before you sit down and open the MR and apply everything I tell you today, it is very, very, very important. I can't emphasize that enough that you look and make sure that from a histopathologic perspective, what you're looking at has been uh, biopsy proven to be a rectal cancer. Because if what you are doing or what you're looking at is a biopsy proven anal cancer, then none of what I tell you is going to apply to anal cancer because the staging and the treatment is totally different. And so, you know, again, the, the, the take home point here is do not try and distinguish rectum from anal base, based on imaging. You need to know that a priori before you look at the exam to apply whatever I tell you. You need to be sure that what you're looking for is rectal cancer and not anal cancer before you, uh, uh, before you um, um, 
uh, you know, start applying the, the rules that we, we talk about today. One more anatomic um, fact that you need to keep in mind is that not the entire part of the rectum is extra peritoneum. Uh, the peritoneum inserts in the upper part of the mid rectum. And so in men, it's typically here, you can see the tip of the Samani vesicle, this black line that you see going towards the rectum is a peritoneal reflection. And in women who have their uteruses, it's typically at the junction of the uterus and cervix, you see this thin black line extending uh, onto the anterior part of the um, uh, anterior part of the rectum. So that is the peritoneal insertion. Above this level, the anterior part of the rectum is lined by peritoneum. And why is that an important point? It becomes important from a staging perspective and it also becomes important from uh, a few of the imaging features that we will be talking on. On axial, if you take an axial slice at this level, this is what it looks like. It has this sort of a gulving pattern of uh, thin black line that is inserted and anteriorly onto the rectum. So when you're looking at your MRs, please make sure that you identify this landmark because this is going to be a key landmark for, uh, for not only for staging, but also for assessing, um, um, assessing some of the other features that we'll be talking about. This is what the specimen looks like. So here is the anterior part of the uh, TME specimen where you can see this glistening surface of the rectum. That's what is lined by peritoneum, whereas posteriorly there is no peritoneal um, line. So, you know, just uh, keep in mind that. Now, the next point is um, the appearance of the, um, the rectal wall on T2 weighted sequence, because that's what governs the, a lot of the staging information that we will be talking about. So here is an anatomic depiction of the wall of the rectum. And this is what we see on an axial uh, T2 weighted sequence. So we look at two bands essentially. Uh, the inner bright or hyper intense ring comprises of the mucosa and submucosa that you're seeing right here. And then the outer ring, which is a dark ring, which is the most important part that we look for is the muscularis propria. So you see this dark line that extends all along, that's the, um, uh, the muscularis propria. And that is one very important structure that we pay attention to when we are looking at the MRs. So here is a, a coronal um, and an oblique image. You can see this is the dark line of the muscularis going all the way around. And this is sort of the relatively brighter mucosa and submucosa. Now there is another structure that you see on this T2-weighted sequence. That's this black line that extends all along uh, in a circumferential manner surrounding the rectum. And that's the other important landmark that we need to pay attention to. And that is the mesorectal fascia. Uh, it's a connective tissue sheet that encloses the, um, uh, the rectum, also encloses the perirectal uh, uh, fat, perirectal vessels, and small nodes that are in that uh, location. And so uh, the reason why this is an important landmark, because uh, as we will see from a staging perspective, as well as um, from a surgical uh, perspective, because typically when the surgeon does their surgery and does the mesorectal excision, they try and um, go along the plane of this mesorectal fascia. Now, it may not be very precise. It could be a little bit to the inside, a little bit to the outside, but this is more or less the, the defined surgical plane, if you will, uh, laterally for the TME. And when the specimen thus comes out, this is the plane of, of resection that is... Um, you know, that is defined by the mesorectal fascia. Now, there are two um, points to remember about the mesorectal fascia. One is it is most uh, generous or capacious in the mid part of the rectum. As you come to the lower part of the rectum, it becomes very closely applied to the, um, uh, to the wall of the rectum. In fact, below the level of the levator muscle, the mesorectal fascia is practically in close um, uh, attachment to the wall of the rectum. And so that's important because, you know, if you have low rectal cancer, then there is a chance that it's directly involving the rectal fascia. And we'll be talking about that in a bit. But this is an important anatomic uh, uh, point to, uh, to keep in mind. And so uh, that brings us to the next point. What is total mesorectal excision? We have been talking about, and this is, you know, this is the surgery that uh, really, um, uh, revolutionize the, uh, the treatment of rectal cancer. 
And what was found is instead of just taking out the rectum uh, along with the uh, cancer, if you dissect along the plane of the mesorectal fascia and not only remove the, uh, the rectum, but also the fat and the, and the lymph nodes and, and structures that are present in the mesorectal fascia, the outcome of patients is much better in terms of reduced chance of local recurrence. So these are diagrams showing you what essentially you are doing when you're doing a TME. You are dissecting along the plane of the mesorectal uh, fascia, and that's what um, defines the lateral extent. So then you'll ask me if TME excision is defined laterally by the mesorectal fascia, how high does the surgeon go and how low does the surgeon go? So in terms of, so this is what the specimen looks like. Here is the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the rectum, rectal lumen with the cancer. You can see right here, you can see all the fat that comes out and this is the plane of dissection laterally along the mesorectal fascia. Now, superiorly, they go up to the takeoff of the inferior mesenteric artery. So you can see this is a CT scan of a patient who has undergone uh, TME surgery and this is where the surgeon has left clips of how superiorly they were. Now, inferiorly depends on whether the cancer involves the sphincter muscle in the anal canal or not. If the cancer does not involve the anal canal, then the surgeon does what is referred to as a LAR, where they basically, um, uh, uh, the inferior margin is at the level of the, uh, the levators or the, the puborectalis, and, and they spare the sphincter muscle. Whereas if the tumor involves the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, sphincter mechanism, then they do what is referred to as an APR or abdominal perineal resection, where they have to sacrifice the, um, the sphincter mechanism and these patients get left with a permanent colostomy. So that's sort of in a nutshell, uh, the what we are looking for, the couple of anatomic facts. Now, in terms of standardized reporting, I'm not going to go through the template, but I will point you to this website. Uh, it's uh, the Society of Abdominal Radiology website, and anybody can go to this website. It's www.abdominalradiology.org. When you go to the website, there is a, a tab for DFPs, which stands for disease-focused uh, panels. And if you click on the rectal and anal cancer panel, it brings you to the uh, various templates that are there. So you don't have to kind of create these on your own. You can just take the templates. Uh, you know, if you click on any, any one of these, for instance, if you click on the um, uh, rectal cancer staging, oops, rectal cancer staging template, it brings the, um, uh, for some reason, the link is not active, but it'll bring the, uh, the template that is available in a PDF format that you can then in, uh, import into your respective reporting, um, uh, reporting, um, uh, you know, software. So you don't have to sort of uh, reinvent the, uh, the the template. So keep an eye, I mean, you, you know, use this as a resource and it gets continuously updated and 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 the um, the DFP panel in SAR has done an excellent job at, uh, at providing the, uh, the most up-to-date uh, recommendations as well as um, a lot of other resources that one can use when looking at these uh, templates. So having said that, um, let's talk about now on the imaging side of things. Yes, you will use a template, but you have to pay particular attention to those uh, imaging features that predict that the rectal cancer is going to behave in, in an in a, uh, adverse prognostic way. In other words, the, the, the prognosis of the tumor is worse than when these factors are not present. And the key factors that we are looking for uh, in terms of adverse prognostic um, indicators are mucinous pathology. And when you do have mucinous pathology, you have very specific imaging appearance. We talk about the T stage and the CRM, which stands for the circumferential resection margin positivity, and we'll go into what that means. Uh, you need to know the presence or absence of EMVI or extramural venous uh, invasion. This is um, Again, relatively um, a new addition to, I mean, it's, it's been around, but you know, a particular emphasis is being paid to this because this is considered to be a harbinger for worse prognosis patients who have EMVI typically behave uh, in, a, in a worse manner with 
having larger number of nodal mats and also being um, predisposed to distant metastases. And then looking at close proximity to the anal sphincter complex, obviously if the anal sphincter complex is involved then, as I said, the surgeon has to do an ATR and these patients are also difficult to get a, uh, get a, um, uh, you know, get a surgically clear margin, especially if the tumor is, um, is well beyond the confines of the uh, sphincter complex. So let's look at each one of these uh, five uh, adverse prognostic indicators. Um, and the reason I'm doing this so that, you know, I'm showing you the worst things that you need to pay attention to when you're looking at that standardized reporting format. And so if you look at the mucinous pathology, as the name implies, if you have mucinous adenous carcinoma, uh, mucin in the adenocarcinoma can be extremely bright on T2, and that's what it looks like. So here is an example of a large uh, mucinous uh, tumor in the, um, you know, in the uh, pelvis, and you can see it's extremely bright. Uh, when you do have this kind of signature of uh, the tumor on the T2-weighted images, it usually uh, means the tumors have a higher pathologic grade. They have a greater tendency for metastases both in the lymph nodes and beyond, and they typically have an unfavorable prognosis. And so here's another example. You can see this is a bright lesion inside the lumen, and it seems to be confined to the wall, but there is a, uh, a lymph node that has uh, near total replacement by the mucinous deposit within it. So, you know, despite being a small lesion, it does have a large nodal metastases in the mesorectal space. So if you do see um, features suggestive of mucinous uh, uh, composition of the adenocarcinoma, you make sure you put that in the report. Then the next point is looking at the T stage and looking at the circumferential resection margin positivity. And so let's look at what this means. So if you look at um, the local staging, the T staging, basically the T1 is confined to the mucosa. T2 disease is confined to the, by the muscularis. It doesn't extend beyond the muscularis. T3 disease is when the disease has spread beyond the muscularis into the surrounding mesorectal fat. And then T4 is when the disease invades adjacent pelvic organs or it invades into the peritoneal cavity. So that's sort of in a nutshell, uh, the T staging of, um, you know, of rectal cancer. Now detection of locally advanced, which means T3, that is, you know, the tumor has gone beyond the muscularis and extends into the mesorectal fat. Um, typically, those patients are treated with pre-surgical chemoradiation therapy. So that is the first point to remember that essentially, you know, our goal is to identify the T3 and, and above. With MR, we don't do a good job of distinguishing T1 from T2, and you shouldn't even make an attempt to because you will be wrong most of the time. And so, you know, one way would be is just to sort of say that the, the tumor appears to be confined to the wall by or by the muscularis, not extending beyond. And once it does, then you call it a T3. Now let's look at T3 disease in a little bit more um, detail. So as I said, T3 disease is when the, when the tumor extends beyond the muscularis into the adjacent mesorectal fat. So here is an anatomic depiction where you see the outline of the mesorectal fascia. These are small normal size nodes. Here is the rectum and this is the tumor uh, that is extending through the muscularis into the adjacent mesorectal fat. Now T3 is divided into four distinct categories. The first is T3A, where the tumor is extending beyond uh, the, uh, the muscularis into the fat, but that extension is less than one millimeter. And in this case, you can see the dark line here, but as you come to this part, you can see that there is relative lack of that black line of the muscularis, and there is a very subtle, less than a millimeter, or practically, um, uh, you know, the tumor is, is sort of invading the muscularis and just stops uh, right there, and it's less than a millimeter of extension into the, um, into the mesorectal fat. Now T3B is when it is between one and five millimeters, and in this case, you can see here is a deposit right here uh, that is going to less than five millimeters into the adjacent um, mesorectal fat. Uh, T3C is when the tumor is greater than five, but less than 15 millimeters. And then finally, T3D is when the tumor is greater than 15 millimeters extending into the mesorectal fat. And so the question is, why are we taking the T3 
and breaking it up into A, B, C, and D. The first fundamental reason why we do that is, is the five millimeter cutoff, which means that tumors, once they extend beyond the muscularis into the adjacent fat, if they are five millimeters or less, their sur overall survival is pretty good but it drops precipitously if it, is, if it extends beyond five millimeters. And so you can see that, you know, essentially the goal of the ABCD is to try and find those that are less than five millimeters where there is a good five-year survival versus those that are greater than five millimeters. And then the survival drops uh, to under 50%. So then you will ask me, well, if it's if it's five millimeters, why don't you just have A and B where it's less than five and greater than five millimeters? The whole purpose of having A and B that is less than a millimeter or between one and five millimeters is because there are certain uh, institutions that still treat early T3 disease as T2, which means they go for surgical resection. And that's the reason why you have that subtle distinction of T3A and T3B. But the take home point for you guys, you know, in terms of T3 disease is remember, if it is less than five millimeter extension beyond into the fat, it usually is good prognosis. Whereas if it is beyond five millimeters into the um, uh, mesorectal fat, prognosis is very bad. Then comes the next point, which is the circumferential resection margin. Now this is a uh, CRM uh, in, in, in short, is a, actually a pathologic term which means once the surgeon dissects along the plane of the um, mesorectal fascia and gives the specimen over to the pathologist, the pathologist then looks at uh, the, um, the extent of the tumor in terms of uh, involvement of this resection margin or circumferential resection margin. So it's essentially a path pathologic term. The other important point to remember is, although it is referred to as a circumferential resection margin, it's not circumferential in the sense that it portrays uh, circumferential resection only below the level of the peritoneal reflection. Above the level of the peritoneal reflection, it is non-circumferential because you cannot assign a CRM status to that part of the rectum that is anteriorly covered by peritoneum. So please keep those two points in mind when you are uh, reading and staging these tumors. So let's look at the equivalent of CRM that we need to put in our reports. And the equivalent is you measure the shortest distance from the tumor to the non-peritonalized part of the mesorectal fascia. So in this case, you are below the level of the peritoneal insertion and you're going to measure this distance, um, which is the shortest distance. Now, the earlier descriptors actually included not only the shortest distance from the primary tumor, but also to positive nodes. But in, in the current consensus and you know, going forward, it's recommended that you only put the shortest distance to the primary tumor. If you do have nodes and, 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 and you, are, you are pretty sure the nodes are positive, you can mention it in the, in the, in the report and let the uh, you know, let the oncologist and the surgeon decide what they would like to, to do with that information. And so, uh, what are the criteria? If the tumor reaches and touches the mesorectal fascia or within one millimeters of the mesorectal fascia, the CRM is considered to be positive. If it is very close, but between one and two millimeters, CRM is considered threatened. And if it is more than two millimeters, CRM is considered to be negative. Again, why are we doing this exercise? We are doing this exercise because if there is involvement of the circumferential resection margin, that usually means there is a higher likelihood that patient is going to locally recur and do worse. And that is the whole reason why we are trying, uh, you know, we are, um, uh, we are taking an extra effort to do and measure this distance. So in this, in this particular example, you're seeing, I have outlined the mesorectal fascia, and you can see that there is a large tumor uh, extension that is uh, involving, it's less than a millimeter. So in this case, it is um, reaching, uh, and in this case, the CRM is positive. And so that's what you will put in your, in your report. Um, now, uh, in terms of CRM positivity, as I mentioned, we, do not consider the involvement of the peritoneal lining. That is a separate 
category in terms of descriptor and a separate category in terms of um, assessing uh, prognosis. So remember, um, it was a thin black line that we saw extending um, from the uh, utero-cervical junction posteriorly into the rectum. In these two different patients, you can see that the tumor is clearly extending to involve that peritoneal reflection. And when you see that, you need to put that in the report and that indicates T4A disease. So it's no longer T3, it's T4A disease. And you know, again, it requires pre-surgical radiation therapy and also um, it indicates worse prognosis because what it tells the uh, referring oncologist is that the uh, tumor has involved the peritoneum and has shed cells into the peritoneal space. And thus there is a higher risk of local um, uh, recurrence. So make sure that you, you mention that. Again, the pitfall alert is the peritoneum involvement is not equivalent to the CRM involvement. Remember, the, um, the, the CRM corresponds to the cut surgical resection margin and does not cover the anterior aspect of the upper rectum. The surgeon cannot influence the free peritoneal surface the surgical resection margin will be negative since the whole rectum will be excised. So that's an important point to distinguish. When you do have peritoneum involvement, it is T4A and it is reported as CRM negative, but you will mention that there is uh, peritoneal involvement. I hope that point is clear so that, you know, that's one um, potential source of confusion and error and when, when reading these uh, cases. Moving on to the next adverse prognostic indicator, and that is the extramural um, uh, venous invasion. And what it essentially means is, you know, you have these perirectal veins that arise from the rectal wall and extend into the adjacent fat. If you have tumor that extends into these veins, then that is considered to be um, an independent predictor of uh, worse prognosis. These patients typically have local and distant recurrences, nodal disease, and the overall survival is worse. MR is extremely good at detecting EMVI and also stratifying patients. So here are two examples. You can clearly see that there is a bifurcating vessel where there is sim similar signal intensity as a tumor extending into the vein. And here is another example where you can clearly see that there is tumor extension into the, uh, into the venous radical, uh, similar in signal intensity as the primary cancer. One word of, um, uh, of uh, caution and also to look for is, you know, sometimes the um, extent of involvement in the vein may not be similar um, in terms of uh, size. In other words, you can have a vein take off from the wall and you can have a larger tumor deposit distally uh, compared to proximally. And just to show you the example, here is a patient where you can see this is uh, the rectal wall right here. And here is a vein that is emanating from the posterior wall of the rectum. And as we scroll, you can see that there is clearly tumor involvement here. But as you go further, there is a larger deposit somewhere in the mid portion of the, um, of the lumen. So keep in mind that you, know, you can have this, um, uh, this nodular deposits along the course of the vessel. And that's something you need to pay attention to and call, uh, you know, call, call it appropriately EMVI. So the lastly is looking at um, close proximity to the anal sphincter complex. And as I mentioned, you have to pay close attention to the anatomy. The anatomy is what um, is going to help you in terms of, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, defining whether there is ex extension into the, um, uh, into the sphincter complex or not. And so if you have involvement of the laverum, so that is considered T4 disease, and again, it is treated as such. And then once it extends lower down into the anal canal, what you're doing is you're trying to look for involvement of three distinct structures. The first is the internal sphincter. The second is the intersphincteric space. And third is the external sphincter. And so you have to be descriptive in your outline and need to let the, know this, need to let the surgeons know if the intersphincteric space or the external sphincter is involved because these two factors are what will uh, sway them towards doing a um, APR uh, versus uh, doing an LAR. And so here is an example of a um, uh, low rectal uh, tumor with the involvement of the intrastrinctric space. So you can see here is a circumferential lesion. On the left, the, the fat in the um, 
uh, is maintained in the uh, in the um, in the uh, left interstitial space as we go as we scan through the coronal on the right side there is clearly tumor involving the interstitial space and it kind of abuts the external sphincter which appears to be relatively ma well maintained in this case so here there is involvement of the internal sphincter and extending into the interstitial space with relative sparing of the external sphincter and again one useful caveat is when the contralateral anatomy is spared, it's good to you know, compare and, and, and show what's going on. And here is another example of a patient where there is external sphincter involvement, two different patients. So here is a mucinous lesion. Clearly, there is extension into the um, external sphincter on the left side and beyond. And here is another patient where you can clearly see there is involvement of the external sphincter on the left and extending beyond the uh, the uh, the external sphincter complex and in this case these these patients clearly will have to undergo um, depending on what the features are um, after knee argument they may still have to get their sphincters sacrificed and get a permanent uh, colostomy so i think that was in a nutshell you know covering um, more or less uh, the pertinent points for rectal cancer mr a couple of take-home messages that I would like to re-emphasize. Uh, do not uh, skimp on the oblique axial plane. Uh, please pay attention to, uh, you know, to your technique to ensure that the oblique axial plane is performed uh, properly. If your techs uh, don't uh, have the ability to identify, which in most cases, you know, it's very difficult for them to know where the cancer is. It requires active participation from the radiologist to ensure that the plane is correctly selected then you have to pay close attention to those factors that contribute to local recurrence. Follow the template, but within the template framework, these are the you know, key elements that you need to pay particular attention to. Looking for the T stage, presence or absence of peritoneum involvement, and then also looking at the CRM status in terms of extension to the mesorectal fascial uh, margin. You are looking for the presence or absence of EMVI, and with low rectal cancers, you're looking for extension into the sphincter complex vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, going into the internal sphincter, intrasphincteric space, or involving the external sphincter. And then, you know, standardized reporting, I can emphasize how important it is to have a standardized template so that everybody in your practice follows the same um, uh, reporting guidelines and follows the same, um, same uh, uh, pattern of, uh, of dictation. With that, uh, I'm going to stop and say thanks again for listening. And um, I will uh, see if there are any questions that the audience would like to, uh, to pose. So there are a couple of questions that have already popped up. Uh, I'm going to read through them and see uh, about the rectum being divided into three portions. Each one measures about five centimeters. The low rectum extends from the anal verge or from the anorectal junction. I think we have uh, gone through that. It's uh, extension from the anal verge, um, and not, um, you know, not from the uh, level of the puborectalis. Can we please see the reporting template? I think uh, I have given, if you go to the Society of Abdominal Radiology website, you don't need a login. You, know, you can pull it up without login information and it should be pretty straightforward to, to, to look at that. What if the tumor involves the anterior peritoneal Again, it is T4A disease that does not count as CRM involvement. The next question is uh, for T3 disease when measuring the distance from the tumor to mesorectal fascia and if the mass has speculation, does one measure from the tip of the longest specule or from the mass itself? And the answer is, um, you know, I didn't cover this, but one source of error between uh, T2 and early T3 disease can be these spicules, which are uh, related to uh, inflammation. And uh, what has been described in the literature is unless you see frank nodular extension of the tumor into the mesorectal fat, you do not call it T3 disease. Subtle spicules can be uh, seen with inflammation. And I know in rectal cancer can be a fairly inflammatory uh, disease. Uh, and so if you have linear lines, those don't uh, classify as uh, T3 disease. Again, there is a difference of opinion between that because uh, you know, there are some groups which will call, call it a T3 disease or early T3 disease, in, even if there are spicules. And this is a dialogue that you need to have with your surgeon uh, to, um, you know, to, uh, to figure out what's the best way to, uh, to do that. 
Uh, can you can you please give us an example where contrast is helpful? Again, I think um, you know, like I said, in our practice, they, it's a useful complement. Uh, sometimes when tumors are uh, you know are fairly large or when tumors are fairly small, uh, looking at the differential degree of enhancement between the wall and the uh, and the tumor can be useful. I'm not saying that that is the primary means for staging, but it can serve as a useful complement to actual detection and staging. Should we be reporting on CRM given that this is the pathologic term? I, I don't think you are reporting on the CRM. What you're giving them is an indication of what they can perceive the status of the CRM to be should they operate on the patient. So that is why you give the distance. You don't call it CRM. You give them the shortest distance between the tumor and the outline of the mesorectal fascia is this. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, somebody has sent a link, uh, looks like. Uh, how do you treat desmoplastic inflammatory reaction in staging as post-treatment? It is very difficult to know the inflammatory changes adjacent to the tumor versus early T3. Again, that's a very good point. I, I did not cover post-treatment um, assessment. That itself is a you know, very detailed topic to go through. Um, and I, I agree with the reviewer that it can be extremely challenging. There are certain um, indicators of how you could uh, classify and you know, uh, describe the tumors one treatment has been given. But uh, again, this is something that um, uh, you, you know, it needs to be described separately. Uh, can the rectal MR on MR below 1.5 T? Uh, you know, my experience is limited to 1.5 and 3 T. Uh, I am not so sure that for the kind of resolution you need on the T2 edited images, if that will be possible on the lower field strength scanners. But again, if you are able to work with a physicist or the vendors and optimize your technique, I think that should be, uh, I mean, you should, you know, give it a try. And if it's, you're getting the kind of quality that is needed, then I, I don't see any reason why that cannot be uh, used. Um, somebody asked about lymph nodes. Again, that's something that I didn't cover uh, today. Um, you know, it's given the time constraints, but um, I, you know, if you look at the most recent, um, if you look at that SAR website, it gives you in that template what should be done with the lymph nodes in terms of uh, calling them positive versus uh, positive versus negative. Uh, let's see, since MRI can distinguish between rectal and anal cancer, is if I get such a case, should I conclude features of anorectal cancer? As I said, I don't think you should even make an attempt to start reading unless you are absolutely certain of the pathology before you start reading because the way rectal cancer is staged and the way anal cancer is staged is totally different and you don't want to um, uh, confuse one for the um, uh, you know, other because it would sort of have profound differences in the way the patients are managed. So please do not, um, uh, do not try and make an attempt to distinguish the two. Do not attempt to start reading unless you have histopathologic proof that you are reading a patient with uh, rectal cancer. Does EMVI occur only anteriorly, posteriorly, or all around? It can occur anywhere. The vessels that arise from the rectum, they don't follow a specific anatomic pattern, so you have to pay close attention uh, throughout the entire circumferential part to, to ensure that you know, the EMVI, is, EMVI is present or not. Should we report nodes in the mesorectal fat? Again, um, uh, yes, if you think the nodes are positive. And again, there are, two, there are three sets of criteria you use for nodes. Again, I would suggest you go to the SAR website uh, to get more information. But if the nodes are above a certain size and or if the nodes are heterogeneous in signal intensity and or if the nodes are irregular in outline, then in those instances, you try and, um, you know, uh, characterize those nodes as potentially positive. And then, you know, you can, what you need to do is say uh, suspicious versus not and then give the total number of suspicious nodes. The other important point with nodes is also to distinguish the nodes that are within the mesorectal fascia versus those nodes that are in the pelvic sidewall. It's important because when the surgeon does the total mesorectal excision, they do not dissect the nodes in the pelvic sidewall. So if you see pelvic adenopathy in the pelvic, in the, in the pelvic sidewall that you think are suspicious, then that needs to be mentioned 
because that will again alter what the surgeon plans to do with the, uh, with the patient. DWI is not very good for distinguishing benign from malignant nodes and I would refrain from, uh, you know, uh, to uh, refrain from uh, looking at the um, uh, DWI for distinguishing uh, or characterizing nodes as benign or malignant. Uh, is there a large technical difference between 3T and 1.5T in terms of diagnostic capabilities? Should we only be doing them on 3T? I can tell you from our experience, we scan on both 1.5 and 3T. And, you know, as long as the protocols are optimized uh, for the 1.5T, you, you get comparable diagnostic information. Clearly, the resolution can be a bit better. But there are also um, uh, sort of disadvantages of scanning on the 3T because bowel peristalsis can be uh, accentuated on the higher field strength. And so I think it's yin and yang. You get you can get more resolution and time on the 3T, uh, but you can also get some artifacts. So it's a balance. And I would say that, you know, if protocols are optimized on each system, then you are not going to have uh, much difference in terms of what the uh, uh, difference is in the field strength. Uh, let's see what else. I think a lot of these are duplicate questions. Uh, somebody's asked, is there a need for endorectal coil for these exams? And the answer is no, a very emphatic no, because, you know, think about it, unlike in the prostate with the, with the rectal, what you're trying to do is look for cancer in the lumen. And if you use an endorectal coil and the coil pushes the tumor away from your uh, coil, you actually end up doing more harm than good to the patient. And so, you know, we do not use an endorectal coil for, um, uh, for uh, looking at um, rectal cancer cases, and I would really uh, refrain from doing that. Uh, it, it can be, uh, it can in fact uh, totally uh, uh, mitigate the usefulness of the exam. So be very careful if you, you know, if you are doing that, I would discourage and, and, and you know, ask you not to, uh, to, do the, to do that. Let's see. What do you think about endorectal ultrasound as a way of determining T1 from T2? That's a good question. And I think um, uh, EUS uh, or endo, endoluminal ultrasonography has a role for distinguishing T1 from T2. They, are, they can get very high resolution images of the uh, rectal wall and are able to tell the difference. Clearly, as I said on MR, it's not, diff it's not easy for us to do that. Uh, the problem with uh, uh, ultrasound is, you know, it's good at looking at the wall. They can't see beyond the wall, and that sometimes poses a challenge. The other issue with uh, ultrasound is, um, and rectal ultrasound is the is the experience of the um, reviewer. So that's something also to keep in mind in terms of um, in terms of you know utility of. One last question: Is it important to use antispasmolytic? Uh, uh, and, and, and again, in the interest of time, we didn't go into the specific, uh, uh, you know, details of the protocol. But yes, uh, if you are, if you have the ability to use antispasmodics, in US, we don't have buscopan. In, in, you know, in European countries and in, in Asian countries, you do have buscopan. I would highly encourage you to use um, antispasmodics because it definitely helps in enhancing the quality of the images. Uh, uh, there have also been instances where they do micro anemas. Uh, they don't, it's not distension of the rectum, but sort of putting minimal amount of fluid into the rectum to enable distension to get good quality images. I think that's the uh, last question. Um, more or less, we have answered most of the questions as there are duplicates. Um, Ashley, I'll hand it over back to you. Yep, as we bring this to a close today, I just wanted to thank you so much, Dr. Harrison Ghani, for your time today. And thanks for all of you for participating in our noon conference. Just a reminder that this conference will be made available on demand within the next 24 hours on mrionline.com. And please join us on Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Dr. Jeanette Collins will be with us for a noon conference on the C-team patterns of lung disease. Please visit mrionline.com to sign up for that one and all future noon conferences. Thanks so much and have a great day.